Cities are often the first in line to respond to these challenges, and yet the policies are often decided on the government level where cities don't have much to say. It's extremely important to think about cities when we think about climate change. And even those cities, from a physical standpoint, take up very little of the, the world's land. They hold the majority of the world's population. So there tends to be um, the temptation to focus on adaptation, climate adaptation in, in rural areas and try to stop migration. But that doesn't stop migration. People will move to cities. When migrants arrive who don't have a lot of resources, they move and they settle in slum areas. A lot of informal settlements are built in hazardous zones, in hazardous places. So you see in coastal cities, mega cities in, in West Africa, migrants arriving and now they're actually, in many cases, increasing their risk for displacement because they're arriving into a flood risk zone. And particularly, you have to think about, you have a different knowledge, you have a different experience of the environment. So if you come from a rural area that's particularly prone to drought, you might know how to more or less cope with a drought. You might know what a drought looks like, what that feels like, what choices you have. But if you arrive in a place and you've never experienced flood, you've never experienced a landslide or a mudslide, First of all, you might construct your home in a way that you shouldn't. You might build a house that's not resilient. And so that lack of local knowledge of um, experience with um, those particular environmental conditions can make migrants extremely vulnerable to now becoming displaced. So migrating and then becoming displaced or becoming displaced to a city, becoming displaced again they might face the ultimate risk, which is mortality or health risks or dangers, things like spreads of malaria, again, diseases that they haven't come into contact with before. And then after a, a disaster, they're, again, they're less able to access uh, help, aid. How do you even understand uh, an early warning system if that early warning system doesn't account for the languages of, of its migrants? Um, health services, uh, humanitarian aid, food aid, and that's amplified if migrants are irregular because then you also have the fear of accessing aid, of accessing help. Because if I go and I try to secure aid or if I try to get medical services, what if I get deported? What we need to do, I think, is to see how climate policies and integration policies can go hand in hand because climate action can also be a great integration tool for migrants, not just for international migrants, but also for internal migrants. Uh, we need to realize that uh, in the global south, very often uh, migrants coming from the countryside experience pretty much the same experience or the same feeling as international migrants. So when it comes to adapting our cities, we have to think about urban planning that prepares for people to come have to start putting in that infrastructure, making sustainable infrastructure, green choices in how we build, but also making sure that it is targeted at the most vulnerable. For example, you have shelters built in Dhaka in Bangladesh. They recently established a shelter for climate migrants that could accommodate up to 1,500 people and provided them with services, preparing them for life in Dhaka, but also life if they choose to return home to their places of origin. At least that's a gesture considering that climate migration is a reality in Bangladesh, it's a reality for Dhaka, and something needs to be done that has that in mind and is, again, inclusive climate action. We need to give cities the proper tools to respond to the challenges of migrant integration and climate impacts.